views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. All right, coming up on this edition of Today's Verdict, with the recent Florida mass shooting, the familiar gun control alarm has rung. But this time, many believe change is in the air. We sit down with our expert to find out if leaders in Washington have the strength to take on the National Rifle Association, also known as the NRA. And keeping with the theme, we went out into your community to hear what you had to say about reforming the nation's gun laws. And the Bronx Defenders, an organization we have featured before on today's verdict, has a new leader. We have the new head of the Bronx Defenders on set for a sit down in studio. As you can see, we have much to get to, so stay tuned. Today's verdict starts right now. Welcome to today's verdict, the live and interactive show that gives you your legal rights and options. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. While today's verdict is always encouraging you to stay connected, make sure to tweet us at today's verdict and hashtag ask today's verdict if you have a question. Also, make sure to like us and follow us on Facebook at today's verdict and check us out at bronxnet.tv. Well, the Bronx community is fed up with a criminal justice system they believe is set up to punish rather than rehabilitate. Organizations have argued for change and the fight continues. One organization, the Bronx Defenders, has a new leader, and today's verdict welcomes Justine Olderman to the studio. Justine, congratulations, Thank you. first of all, for uh, taking over. Love the Bronx Defenders, uh, but some people don't know about the Bronx Defenders, so why don't you tell everybody uh, what the organization does, if you Great. could? Thank you so much for having me. So the Bronx Defenders is a nonprofit organization here in the South Bronx, and what we're trying to do is redefine public defense and in doing so, really to transform the way that people are treated in our justice system. Well, um, the justice system itself has so many different facets to it, right? We have um, criminal court, many times we have family court, and I would assume many of the other courts get involved as well. Does the Bronx Defenders take on all of it or just a few of the different uh, areas? We do, we take on all of it. And our model essentially says we go wherever the client goes. One of the problems with our justice system is that justice involvement leads to more justice involvement. So I'll give you an example. Let's say somebody is arrested for having drugs, a small amount of drugs in the home, right? Certainly that person might end up in criminal court. But if they live in public housing, that person might also end up with a housing court case. And if they're a legal permanent resident, they might end up in deportation proceedings. Let's say they have a child that was at home with them, that might actually trigger some sort of family court involvement where actually their ability to parent their child is now being challenged in court. So we go wherever the client goes and we defend that client by whatever means necessary. Well, let's talk about some of the crimes that, some of the underlying crimes which starts the whole process off. Um, there has been a push to try and limit um, the ability of the police or the ability of, of the prosecutors to really go after you for some low level crimes. Mm -hmm marijuana possession, some of the smaller things. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you find in the organization? Is, has that been happening? It has been happening, but not enough. Okay. I'll give you an example. Sure. It turns out that about four or five years ago, we represented about 16,000 people just here in the Bronx, charged with low-level nonviolent offenses like the type you're talking about. Turnstile jump, trespass, marijuana possession, that sort of thing. Last year, in 2017, we represented 10,000 people. That's a great improvement. However, that is still almost half of the entirety of the people that we represented in the Bronx in criminal court last year. It is still way too many. Now, I guess the theory behind prosecuting for the low-level crimes is that they will lead to prosecution of crimes of a greater magnitude. Does that usually follow or is that a myth? It doesn't follow. It is a total myth and it is exactly the thing that is being trotted out and has been for decades to justify broken windows policing. 
We did an analysis of turnstile jumping because we hear often, even from our mayor and from the NYPD, that sometimes those types of offenses, the reason why we police them in the way that we do, is because, in fact, it leads to arrest for more violent offenses or even weapons possession. And yet what we found is that the vast majority of our clients who are charged with jumping the turnstile had no other charges associated with that, just turnstile jumping, which suggests a very different story. Well, what about you know, looking at certain parts of the community or areas of the community that seem to need more policing than other areas? Um, you know, there might be a, a particular housing complex mm -hmm. that has more crime that seems to be going on there. I think the it looks like the, the police are targeting that area. What, are you, what is the Bronx defender's position on something like that? The problem is that what we're seeing is that the same types of offenses that are being policed heavily, as you just made reference to, in places like the South Bronx, are not being policed in the same way in more affluent, whiter communities. And ultimately, that type of policing practice is not only leading to things like discriminatory stop and frisk. So it's a profiling is really what's happening. It is a profiling, and ultimately, that is one of the main problems with our criminal justice system, is that it is being flooded and clogged with low-level offenses that have at their root, at their core, this discriminatory policing practice. So what is the... The, the process that occurs when somebody on social media takes a picture of themselves mm -hmm. with somebody who actually committed a crime, who is in the same housing complex, are they being mm -hmm. implicated? Are they being watched? Is Big Brother now looking at, at Facebook mm -hmm. and, and the Instagram to see who you're associating with? They certainly are. They are. And what you've heard about sometimes uh, in the media that is just beginning to get attention is this problem with the NYPD keeping what they call a gang database. So the NYPD, based on that type of analysis, looking at social media, who's associated with who, what color clothing they're wearing, is labeling people in their own private database as being gang affiliated. There's no due process there. There's no actual evidentiary hearing that goes with that label, and there's no way to challenge it. And yet, that is one of the things that is motivating policing practices. Now, why? Where are they getting this directive from? Is it just to make a quota? Is it just because they? Has, it's a it's a gut feeling that a police officer has. Well, if if X is doing this in this particular housing project, Y and Z in the same project probably are doing it as well. I can't speak to the motivation behind it, but I can speak to the effect. And what we see over and over again is people coming out and lauding what they call precision policing, right? These gang, what they call takedowns. And when you sort of look a little bit more closely, when you pull back the curtain of that, what you realize is that they are arresting huge numbers of people, let's say from a particular housing community. And everybody is getting swept up in this, whether they themselves are involved in any kind of real gang activity or violent behavior or not and it's almost like it's just guilt by association. All right, Justine, let's take let's take everybody from the arrest uh, to the, on the street and we're going to talk a little bit about what you should or shouldn't say later sure. but into the actual criminal court um, mm -hmm. process. Uh, I know this also involves immigration and things that can go on. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So at the Bronx Defenders, one of the things we do is that we represent people who are in the criminal courts, as well as in family court, immigration court, housing, et cetera. And that means that we are fighting for their rights in that courthouse. But what we are also doing at the same time is that we are fighting systemically, more broadly, for fairness and equality in the justice system. And what we're finding is that that is an uphill battle. Well, let's say um, myself, let's say, for, for instance, uh, I, I get picked up for a low-level low offense, but say DWI, and I end up in the system, and I'm not legal, mm -hmm. all right? Is someone looking for me mm -hmm. as I'm walking the halls of uh, Supreme Bronx uh, Criminal Court? They sure are. So we have seen a 900% increase in ICE courthouse arrests. What I mean by that is that ICE agents are literally coming into our courthouses. They are staking out courtrooms. They are waiting for those people, like you just said, charged with low-level, nonviolent offenses to go in, to fight for their day in court. These are people who have pleaded not guilty. These are people who are saying, I want my day in court. These are people who are coming to our justice system to seek due process. But how do they find me? How do they know I was arrested for DWI? How do they even know I would be in the courtroom 
How do they know? So first of all, there's this incredible database sharing that is happening, right? As we have all benefited from improvements in information technology and the transferring of information, so have different law enforcement agencies. So there's the immediate sharing of information through fingerprints, but that's not all. In addition, all court cases, in terms of the dates that cases are on and when they are on, are accessible through public databases. And so what essentially is happening is they are looking at those databases and figuring out when is your next court date? What, court date, what courtroom are you going to be in? Then they are coming to the courthouse and they are waiting and they are watching and they are communicating with court staff to find out. Can you know who they are? Or Sometimes you do. Are they plain clothes? Sometimes you don't. Are they wearing uniforms? They are in plain clothes. They do not have badges out. They are not identifying themselves. The whole purpose of their operation is to, is stealth. They are trying to do it so that nobody knows that they are there and that they can come and snatch somebody who simply came to court to, to get their day in court. And all of a sudden, they are whisked off in a van, put into deportation proceedings, and we are finding that our clients are being sent back to countries they have not lived in since they were children. Okay, let's get back to the person on the street. Yeah. Um, this is very important. Um, we don't have too much time, but somebody is um, approached by an uh, undercover officer, or just an officer, asks for ID, asks, mm -hmm. um, who are you, where do you live? What advice do you give? Because we get these questions all the time at Today's Verdict. What do I do when we're approached by somebody who wants to know about me? Do I have to tell them? Do I have a right to a lawyer? That kind of thing. So what we do at the Bronx Defenders is we go out into the community and we do a lot of Know Your Rights trainings. So if your viewers are interested in going to one of our Know Your Rights trainings, they should reach out to the Bronx Defenders and we can tell them where we're having them and when we're having them next. But what we essentially do with those trainings is we make sure that everybody understands what are their rights. In New York, there's a complex legal system that talks about different things that police can do based on certain levels of information. And we teach people what their rights are. That being said, the realities on the street are oftentimes very different. So we also help people navigate what are their choices in that moment when their rights and the reality are not coming together. And most of all, what we teach people is how to stay safe. Okay, well I remember, you know, from way back from law school, it was if a police officer asks you to op open the trunk and there's nothing in the trunk, open the trunk. Don't provoke, don't, and even though they may not have a right, if, if you feel that you have nothing to hide and you don't want to escalate a situation, then open the trunk. But I can understand also that you don't have to give in if it's not, uh, if it's not the time to do it. Some tips. Somebody's watching right now. They want to. They want to know what to do. Their family's been a member's been arrested. They're not legal. And where do we find you? I guess. Oh well, you can find us uh, in the South Bronx. Uh, we're at 360 East 161st Street, um, and you can reach out to us. We have a community intake program. Um, our doors are open. We're at street level. We're there in the community to be able to meet people's needs. And so, basically, your advice is to come and see you if, if unfortunately that happens. Am I correct? A absolutely. All right, and you're going to come back, and we're going to discuss a little bit more. Love to. All right. We have to take a quick break, but don't worry, we'll be back with more Today's Verdict right after this. I'm Ferdinand. You look at me and think big. You think scary, but I'm a little misunderstood. Sorry, I almost killed you! We've all been misunderstood. You ought to fight it. Oh, I don't understand that at all. Kids with learning and attention issues like dyslexia and ADHD are misunderstood too. Take the time to understand. Best plan ever! With the right support, everyone can reach their full potential because you can't judge a bull by his cover. Learn more at understood.org.
Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments, goofy moments, sporty moments, dorky moments, kooky moments. Moments where we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count, because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. They call me Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me, now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me, I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. Meanwhile, we went out to your community to hear what the public had to say about the recent mass shootings and the renewed interest in reforming our gun laws. Let's take a look. mass shootings, we asked Bronxites in the Kingsbridge community their opinion about gun laws. Anytime, you know, we have a situation like that, I think that, you know, if the current laws aren't working, the stronger, you know, we make them, the better off we hopefully will be. Stronger gun laws and, like, inflicting on who is able to get them and doing deeper background checks will definitely help. But. I think you should stop those machine guns from sell to public in general. Those guns are war guns. They're not supposed to sell by public. Um, I think there should be more um, stricter guidelines as far as the um, the processing, as far as that goes. As, as far as like you know, I know in some states you know there's a certain time frame you have to wait before you're able to purchase the gun. So I think there should be more uh, stricter when it comes to that, as far as like the screening process. I don't feel that uh, guns in in school provide safety uh, because. It's not just about being safe in school, it's about being safe in your community. So, you know, um, people should feel safe in and outside of the building. We don't want anybody getting hurt or, or, um, or dying. Teachers, um, they're, 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 they're teaching kids to learn, not like to, to, to use guns. It's like, Guns are, are shouldn't be in schools. You're supposed to be learning, not not using bad stuff like other people, like criminals. The government is supposed to don't let the people buy guns, especially the young people. Welcome back. It is all too common a shooting that occurs in a school leaving multiple fatalities. Why does this keep happening? Can our leaders finally stand up to the strong gun lobby and change the way guns are sold in our country? Joining us today to discuss the renewed gun control debate is attorney Rebecca Fisher. Rebecca, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, New Yorkers Against Gun Violence. Let's talk a little bit about the organization to start off. Tell us a little bit about it. Sure. New Yorkers Against Gun Violence is a statewide organization. We've been around for over 20 years, and we advocate for common sense uh, gun safety legislation at the state, local, and federal level. Um, we not only do advocacy work, but we also have a community-based program um, that's housed under New Yorkers Against Gun Violence Education Fund. Um, and we do community-based education programming in schools in seven different public high schools around New York City, including up here in the Bronx. All right, well, uh, unfortunately, when there's a tragedy of this type of um, proportion, I'm sure you get a lot of calls, and we have, unfortunately, another situation that occurred in Florida. That's right. Um, what are your immediate thoughts, other than just, oh, not again? What, what, what are your immediate thoughts about, really, what occurred with this particular tragedy? 
you have any thoughts on that? This is a circumstance in which, once again, an individual in crisis who had previously exhibited dangerous behavior um, to his family and to others, to the community, to members of his school, was able to access guns easily because of the weak gun laws in Florida and also across the country. Now, this particular individual I know actually put out on social media mm -hmm. that he was going to be a school shooter. Mm -hmm. um, who reviews this types, these types of uh, posts? Uh, does law enforcement look at it? Who's supposed to look at it and make sure that the proper authorities are informed? My understanding is that law enforcement should be looking at this, the FBI should be looking at this. Um, you know, presumably you would think that community, the community itself and parents should be looking at social media posts that their children are putting online and sharing it with each other and school administrators to ensure that the appropriate enforcement agency is, is notified. Now he used a particular weapon, um, this assault rifle. That's right. Um, how did he get a hold of the weapon? In other words, uh, in Florida, is it, do you have to be a particular age? Was he, did he buy it legally? Tell us a little bit about he that. He did. Uh, assault weapons are legal. Um, there is no ban in the state of Florida, um, as opposed to here in New York State, where uh, military-style rifles of that kind are banned um, here in New York State, and you're not permitted to carry a gun of that kind. Um, however, uh, in Florida and other states across the country, you can easily access a gun of that kind that creates um, mass carnage at that scale. And, you know, and he's been, he was expelled from the school. He had some real mental um, challenges mm -hmm. with his mother dying and some other issues that were going on, and yet nobody seems to take blame for what really occurred, and certainly not the, um, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, which right. promotes um, uh, the ability to be able to buy guns per the Second Amendment. Well, what are your thoughts? Well, look, I mean, I think that in addition to the fact that um, we need comprehensive universal background check system in this country um, and assault weapons should be banned at the federal level, um, there is room for policy change even here in New York State that would empower family members and household members and law enforcement to um, remove guns from individuals who have demonstrated that they are dangerous to others but who have not necessarily been convicted of a crime. Um, and that happens a lot, that an individual will, um, you know, either be suicidal and demonstrate that they might be dangerous to themselves or do other things, domestic abuse, um, or be dangerous to their family members or their peers, but have not actually been convicted of a crime. And that's why New Yorkers Against Gun Violence, um, this session, and actually many other gun violence prevention organizations across the country are specifically pushing a bill called the Extreme Risk Protection Order Bill. Um, and that bill would allow, here in New York, allow family, household members, and law enforcement to petition a court um, to obtain an extreme risk protection order that would allow them to remove the guns from an individual in crisis for up to a year. Now, what would you have to show if you were the one petitioning the court? Um, That's right. Because it's tough to get the mental health records of somebody who's not releasing them. You know, that little 9A that has to be initialed to get the hospital records or some kind of records. How would you even find out what kind of crisis that, that the individual might be having? So that's right. It is. It, it may be a challenge to get um, confidential mental health records, but the evidence that needs to put forth is not necessarily just based on the diagnosis or evaluation of a mental health provider. Um, it can be based on the testimony of a family member that the individual has been um, violent towards their pets or sure. um, has been threatening to kill themselves and brandishing their gun. Which, by the way, this particular individual in Florida was apparently hostile to That's pets that were, that, next, that were next door. There was, a, you know, pigs and dogs. And you, you almost can see sometimes the person who does it, why they did it or that they would have done it. The problem is you just, I guess you just don't know far enough beforehand, right. you know, how to stop it. Um, I took you off topic a little bit, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, we're, tr we're trying to create a system and we're trying to get a tipping point now where the NRA finally wakes up. It, c is this the time? You know, um, as someone who's been working in this, uh, this field since the Sandy Hook massacre, 
um, one would always hope and be optimistic that after such a tragedy of this kind that the needle is going to move. Um, I do think that I see a different um, response from the American people um, this particular time that you didn't see after the Las Vegas shooting. You didn't see after Sutherland Springs. Um, not only um, are American adults reacting, but you see um, high school students Wh really stepping why? forward. Why do you think this shooting was different from the Las Vegas? Las Vegas shooting was a concert. It was mm -hmm. young people at a concert. Um, the, the, the shooting you mentioned before involved, the, you know, kindergarten kids and first graders. That's right. Why this school? What, what, what's going to change now? I think, you know, I, I think in this moment in time, I think it's been building. I think that people have been increasingly unsettled um, after the Las Vegas shooting and the tension over this issue has been building. I think that um, in general, um, people are very unhappy with what's happening in Washington. And so the resistance effort has been building that momentum as well. And also, um, you know, just a few months ago, you saw the um, Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act, the, the uh, gun lobby's top legislative priority get passed in the House of Representatives. I think that shocked a lot of people. Um, they, they can't fathom the fact that our Congress, in light of everything that's going on, would support a bill that would bring more guns into our public spaces, including here in New York. Sounds ridiculous. It, it, it really, it's unfathomable, but there, there are um, people in this country that um, buy into the gun lobby's argument that more guns will make us safer, which is why they want to arm teachers in schools. And by the way, you know, that security guard was armed, and he, uh, was, or the officer, the sheriff, mm -hmm. he didn't even go in. That's right. And he was, you know, he was basically asked to resign, or he did resign, because he was hiding out in the parking lot and not going into the school, killing the killer, as they said he was supposed to do. And so it didn't even make a difference, the fact that he was armed. That's right. I mean, I think time and time again, you see that um, good guys trained to um, defend and protect. They panic. Um, are, they panic. They're human beings as yeah, well. Sure. But they the, know somebody's in there with, it, with, with, with an automatic uh, assault rifle. He has a pistol. He may not have fired it for 25 years at the range once or twice. And now he's going to go in there and take on this guy. And uh, he probably well, got scared. He has a family himself. He probably just a uh, human, human nature. You know, it's easy for us to say, well, you're a police officer, you go in there and take care of this. Well, you're a human being and your families and... So and why should law enforcement be faced with right. a military-style rifle in that context? Um, I mean, I think it's compromising the safety of our law enforcement to put them in that position. But certainly when you start talking about policy that would require teachers to arm themselves when they are educators and to protect children in that context, it's completely inappropriate and um, is really putting them in danger. Very quickly, where do we find you if somebody wants to reach out to your organization? Um, we can, we're down um, downtown in Canal Street. Um, you can reach me at nyagv at nyagv.org. You can also call us at 212-679-2345. Perfect. And you're going to come back. Unfortunately, we may see more of this type of thing, but hopefully this is the uh, tipping point. Unfortunately. As, uh, and I, I would encourage all, all of those who are watching the show and students to really get involved because now is the time. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank right. you. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and, of course, you, the viewers, for watching. If you missed any part of today's show, be sure to check it out at www.bronxnet.tv. Also, remember, if there is a legal issue or topic you'd like to see on a future edition of Today's Verdict, feel free to contact me at davidlesh at bronxnet.org or tweet us at Today's Verdict and make sure to hashtag Ask Today's Verdict. From myself and all of us at Today's Verdict, always remember, know your rights, know your issues, reach a verdict. We'll see you next time.